Please help me welcome our next speaker. He's a senior staff engineer at Schneider Electric with the Power Systems Engineering Group. He's a member of IEEE 1584P Working Group on Arc Flash Calculations. Help me welcome Tony Parsons. All right, thank you, John. Thank you, everybody. Good to be with you here this morning to talk with you about the other aspect of Arc Flash. What we're going to do is look at, uh, take a few minutes to look at some, some things around DC arc flash analysis. We've actually got a, what we call a comparative study of DC arc flash analysis methods in ETAP, which is something we started looking at, frankly, because we got curious about it. And I think many of you are probably aware that, you know, at least since 2012, there has been an equation in NFPA 70E that we could use to estimate uh, arc flash levels in DC systems. I don't know how many of you may be aware that there are also a couple of other calculation models out there that are also part of the ETAP software. So it just kind of got us to thinking, you know, why do we need three different models? Which one is right? When should we use this one versus this one versus the other one? Started looking into it, some interesting things came out of it. I don't know that I'll be able to answer all those questions about which one is the most accurate one, when you should use this one, or at least give you conclusive answers on some of these things, but hopefully we'll start working toward some answers for, for those kind of questions and at least you know, get a little bit better understanding of what's going on uh, with the calculation models that we do have available. So where are we going to start? We'll start looking at a little bit of background on what is out there. First, just kind of a quick overview of the development of arc flash calculation models in general. You know, we've got them kind of divided up here on the left-hand side, AC systems, and on the right, the DC. You know, with AC, uh, there, there actually have been calculation models out there from longer than most people realize. It really dates back to the early 1980s. Uh, Ralph Lee, who was an engineer with DuPont, uh, developed a theoretical model uh, for estimating incident energy that we now refer to as the maximum power method. Um, so that, that kind of kicked everything off. Uh, over the years, starting in the early 90s, there started to be testing done, actually working toward developing empirical models of arc flash levels on AC systems. And as you've just heard, that testing effort is very much alive, and the development of these empirical models continues even now. DC systems, on the other hand, kind of got a little bit less background, or a little bit, uh, uh, well, a much shorter track record there on, on, on that side of the column. Kind of start off back in 2010, there was an IEEE paper published on DC arc models and incident energy calculations. I'll give you a little bit more detail on what was in that and why we care about it as we go through the presentation. Uh, 2012, I already mentioned, that's when the maximum power calculation method was adopted to DC systems and started appearing in uh, NFPA 70E. One more uh, relatively recent development, there's an alternate maximum power method that's actually applicable to DC uh, photovolta photovoltaic systems. Um, I'm going to touch on that just briefly in the presentation this morning, but if you want to learn more about that, a good way to do that is to come to the tutorial on Wednesday afternoon. You can hear some more about that. What you can see from this, you know, even with the high-level overview, with AC, we've had a long history of development. We've had a lot of testing that's gone uh, behind it to kind of help validate and, and, and develop these, these models that we've come up with. DC is kind of the new kid on the block. Not a whole lot, uh, you know, not a whole lot of detail there. Um, insufficient, at least up to this point, incident energy testing done. Dr. Lee and I have already talked a couple times this morning about extending the testing to DC. You know, hey, job security, if you needed any. Uh, certainly there, we, got, you know, we need to ex extend that effort. We're going to show some of the reasons why we, why we need to do that as we go through this. doesn't mean that there's nothing out there for DC systems, though. So let's take a look and see what we do have. First, with the maximum power model. This is, again, Ralph Lee back in 1982. Lee basically said, let's assess the arc flash hazard by treating both the arc and the worker as a sphere. Some workers are a little more spherical than others. The arc is not exactly a sphere. It's an assumption, obviously, that's built in there. But assume that they're both spheres, and then use heat transfer theory to figure out how much energy really gets from point A to point B. As assumptions go, that's not entirely accurate, but it turned out to be, you know, it, it actually gives us pretty good results. A much bigger assumption in terms of actual impact on the calculation results comes with something that Lee assumed about the nature of the arc itself. 
And back in 1982, he didn't have a general theoretical model of the DC arc flash event that he could use to try and figure out exactly what was going on. And so I've got kind of a, a simple equivalent circuit up there kind of used to, to, to illustrate this. We've got a Thevenin equivalent voltage source over there on the left, Thevenin equivalent system impedance up at the top. Basically on that circuit, the arc itself looks like a load. If we want to figure out how much power is delivered to the arc, how much power is delivered to the load? Well, we need to know something about that load. What's its resistance? What's the voltage drop across that load? Lee didn't know. So he said, okay, I'm gonna make an assumption. The assumption that he made, he said the voltage drop across that arc equals one half the system voltage. Or another way to think of that, the magnitude of the arc resistance equal to the magnitude of that Thevenin equivalent system impedance. Or another way to think of that, the arcing fault current through that arc equals one half the total available bolted fault current. Think back to circuits 101, that's the condition you need for maximum power transfer to the load. Basically, you have impedance matching between the load and the system. Lee didn't know what the arc was supposed to look like, so he said, okay, we're just gonna make a conservative assumption, assume that we can deliver maximum power to that arc. Okay, when you do that, it actually works out to be a fairly simple calculation. Arcing fault current is simply one half that bolted fault current, and there's the equation from IEEE 1584. We plug in the voltage, we plug in that current, Clearing time, we got a distance, and we can get an instant energy number. What well, could be easier than that? How accurate is it? Well, 70E has a reference in there that talks about testing that was done by, by an, another party that showed that the results from the incident, or <coughs> excuse me, the maximum power method were conservatively high, but doesn't really give you much detail. Um, one thing that we could do, we could go back and look at AC testing that was done in the early 90s, early to mid 90s, where they actually, one of the things that they did initially was do tests to see how accurate or inaccurate the Lee method actually was. One of the highlights from that, for low voltage systems, you know, 480 volt or 600 volt AC, there was actually fairly good agreement between the, the Lee calculation and the measured results. Medium voltage, things diverged quite a bit. We get a long way away from that maximum power transfer condition. And that's at least one of the reasons why 70E says that the maximum power method only applies up to 1,000 volt DC. Okay, let's go beyond that. Stokes and Oppenlander and Powkert. Those are our other two calculation models that are out there. Stokes and Oppenlander, a couple, in a couple of Australian guys. Powkert was over in Europe somewhere, uh, Poland maybe, or Germany. I don't remember exactly. Anyway, there was a 2010 uh, IEEE paper uh, published that basically went back and reviewed art testing, not only done by those guys, but by uh, other groups of researchers dating back actually to the early 1900s. Of course, they weren't doing arc flash incident energy testing back in the early 1900s. What were they worried about back then? They were interested in arc lighting. And so they did some work to characterize the arc. Anyway, there are you know, a number of, of models that have been developed over the years. The Stokes and Oppenlander and Powkert were probably the most comprehensive ones that were developed and most relevant to what we look at when we're looking at arc flash incident energy calculations. So the authors here developed a, a calculation method based on both of, those, you know, both, of those, both of those models. Both of those models appear in ETAB as alternatives to the maximum power method. Let's look at them real quick, Stokes and Oppenlander first. They looked at both vertical and horizontal arcs in open air. On DC, they, actually a mix of, of DC and AC test results. The DC testing uh, tended to be done at the lower current levels, less than 1,000 amps available bolted fault current. At 50 hertz, remember they were Australian, so they were looking at 50 hertz. 50 hertz, uh, they tested all the way up to 20 kA. They tested a pretty wide range of electrode gaps, five to 200 or five to 500 millimeters. Um, supply voltages were actually fairly high compared to what we're usually used to looking at. Keep in mind, what they were trying to do was not necessarily, you know, figure out what the arcing fault current was. Not, they weren't doing testing exactly like we're, we're doing with the AC testing these days, but they were trying to characterize the arc itself. The arc largely is based on the geometry of the arc, what's the gap of the electrode. It didn't matter so much what the, you know, what the, what the supply voltage was. Obviously, it affects the current, but if you can really come up with a good model for the resistance of the arc itself, you can figure out what the current is with the different, you know, different uh, source voltage levels. So don't let, th let that throw you off. They did develop equations. The equations that got shown up there on the right-hand side. Actually, they've got, there, there's two sets of equations. The graph at the bottom, you know, kind of shows, I don't know if you can read it, but it says transition point there in the middle. Actually, they developed a set of equations for very low fault current levels, you know, 10 to up to maybe 100 amps at most. And then another set for, for uh, currents over to the right, the higher current values. What I've got shown up there are the equations for those, those points to the right of that transition point. Continuous equations that, that vary based on the electrode gap. 
and the, and the arc and current through it. And again, Ammermoon and those that wrote the, the IEEE paper applied that work to incident energy calculations. Paukert, fairly, fairly similar. He examined testing done by a number of researchers and research groups, including some of his own works. He looked at uh, vertical and horizontal arcs, um, 0.3 to 100 Ka, so pretty wide range in there, gaps from one to 200 millimeters. Again, the lower range of, arc, of arcing or uh, fault current levels was DC, higher range was 50 hertz. Even had some tests thrown in there for impulse currents. So not, you know, not, not really any frequency that we can, we can assign to those. He also developed equations for arc voltage and arc resistance, actually a set of equations, not just one continuous equation, but kind of has a, like a, a you know, model depending you know, for, for different ranges of, of bus gaps. Uh, and again, this one was also applied to the incident energy calculations. Okay, so these guys weren't really specifically testing for arc flash incident energy. Is this really relevant to us? What does it mean for us? Well, think about it this way. You know, even if we, we don't always think of it like this, the incident energy depends heavily on the amount of power that's transferred to the arc. Now, that's a step that's kind of buried in our calculation method in IEEE 1584. But if we know the power, we can figure out how much energy. If we know the energy, we can figure out how much of that gets transferred to the worker. So if we have a model that we can use to calculate the arc voltage, then based on that arc voltage, we can calculate an arcing current. Voltage times current equals power. Power times time is energy. All of a sudden, we're right back where we need to be. And so we've got, you know, we've got a, a, a basis to build a calculation model. It, the only complicating thing, it's not a nice linear thing with Ohm's law anymore. We've got a you know, nonlinear, uh, the resistance is a nonlinear function of arc current. Good thing we have some calculation tools to help us out with that kind of thing. But point being, you know, if we can get an accurate estimation of voltage and current through the arc, we can get an estimate of incident energy. The maximum power method, while it's intended to be conservative, was never necessarily intended to be accurate. So there's at least an opportunity for these alternative methods to maybe give us a little bit better answer or a little bit better resolution when we look at this stuff. ETAP, uh, for its part, the incident energy part, you know, we, we, we've calculated the, the, the arc voltage, we can calculate the arc and fault current to get that to energy, the second line there, energy in the arc equals I squared times the resistance of the arc times time, and then we can take that and convert it to an incident energy. Two equations down on the bottom, the first one is for open air arcs, that's kind of the method dating back to the Lee, uh, the Lee model. The one on the bottom, the arc in a box configuration. We've got some parameters there. This was based on uh, some, some work done by a guy named Bob Wilkins, who looked at the IEEE 1584, the original test data set, and came up with a you know with an equation here where he had some parameters that depended on the actual configuration of the box. You guys know that if you have an arc in a box, it tends to focus some of the energy towards the worker, and so we can have kind of a multiplier effect when we look at incident energy. So you know, open air arc, arc in a box, two ways to take those, you know, take our Stokes and Open Lander and Paukert models and apply them to the calculations we want to do. Um, I'm going to kind of gloss over this stuff uh, here in the interest of time, but just a, a quick aside, remember all this stuff we're talking about, they are empirical models. Empirical models as such, they're based on testing done over a certain range of parameters. Always important to keep those parameters in mind. What happens when we start going outside the range of the testing? We had a question before about how come um, you know, IEEE 1584 cuts off at 15 kV. One of the answers is testing was done to 15 kV. We get outside that range, we start having issues. We got to do, or we, we, it's not necessarily that we start having issues. We don't know if we have issues. Always keep that in mind when we're looking at in, in empirical methods. Not to say that we can't use them, um, but just re, you know, just uh, something to keep in the in the back of our minds as we look at this stuff. Okay, so let's go on. We've got our background there. Let's go on to actually looking at uh, some comparisons of our three calculation methods. What are we going to compare? Well, obviously, we're going to compare the maximum power method, the Stokes and Oppenlander and, and, and Paukert, but compare them in terms of what? Uh, there are lots of ways to look at this, and I don't know that any of them are entirely satisfactory, or at least none of them were to me. Um, one issue was that it was, it's, it's a fairly complex thing to look at. There, there are a lot of variables out there, a lot of different parameters that we, that we can vary. What do we look at to try to get a good comparison between these, these two methods, or three methods? The other issue, and maybe the bigger one, there's no right answer. Remember I said we didn't have a whole lot of testing, didn't have much testing at all done with, on, on DC systems. So once you do a calculation with one of these methods, how do you know whether it was a good result or not. You don't have much out there to benchmark it against. We actually do have a little bit of test data, and we're going to show those, you know, show some of that as we, as we go through the presentation. 
Um, we can compare, but, but you know, keep that in mind. That's one of the issues that you have when you, when you start looking at these things. We did do some comparisons of the three calculation methods to one another. And even though that sounds like we're chasing our tail a little bit, uh, we did find, I think, what are some useful conclusions out of, out of doing this. What we did look at, a couple of things, arcing fault current versus bolted fault current was one of the big ones. Um, of course, there's a couple of ways that this is important. One, this helps us determine uh, you know, how much power we're actually going to be delivering uh, you know, to that load. The arcing current, of course, depends on the arcing voltage. Are we close to impedance matching? Are we a long way away from it? it gives us an idea of where we're at in, in, in terms of the, the power. And of course, um, the arcing fault current is very important because it also helps us determine what the clearing time is going to be. If you have a circuit breaker, you have a fuse, you have a relay in a system that's going to you know, clear the fault in a certain amount of time, how quickly that operates depends on how much arcing fault current you have. So very important thing to, you know, to look at and get a handle on. The other thing that we looked at was arc power versus the maximum power. Maximum power method obviously is calculating the maximum power to the arc, but what about the other two and how much power delivered to the arc did they give us versus the, you know, the maximum power method? What I've got is a graph here. The blue line is showing the, you know, the variation of arc current with the arc voltage, the point right in the middle where we have 50% arc voltage and 50% arc current, you read up, that's the point where we hit the peak. That's our maximum power. That's the maximum power transfer to the load. You can see that as you move away from that, you know, it, it moves kind of slowly at first on that, on that power graph, but you don't have to move very far before you kind of start falling off the edge of that, that slope. Kind of a, it's not exactly a sinusoid, but it looks kind of sinusoidal, doesn't it? So we move off that pretty quickly. When, once we get away from that maximum power transfer condition, we're doing anything but maximum power to the arc, so that maximum power method is kind of losing some of its accuracy. So we're going to look at that and see how that varies with the different parameters. We looked at the models over a range of voltages, 125 volts all the way up to 1,000 volts DC, bus gap from a quarter of an inch up to eight inches, or if you want to be more politically correct, I guess six millimeters to 200, bolted fault currents all the way from 1 kA to 100 kA, just to see what we would find. We're going to take a look at some of the examples and use them to draw some insights. Here's one. I'll uh, we'll start out with looking at arcing fault current versus bolted fault current. That's on the left, and then the power's on the right. We've got a system here with 250 volt DC uh, system voltage and a 25 millimeter gap. And what I've got shown on the left, at the 50% line, that's our maximum power. He just camps out right there at 50%. Arcing fault current equals one half bolted fault current all day long. The other two models come in actually somewhere near that level. You know, Stokes and Oppenlander is shown in red. The Powkert is shown in, in green. Um, over most of the range, they stay within, you know, roughly 40 to 60 percent of the bolted fault current. What that means is the arcing fault current calculated by those models is 40 to 60 percent of whatever the maximum bolted fault current level was in that circuit. And that goes up as we get down to very low fault current levels. That's because at that point, the system impedance is high. We have a low fault current available in the system. System, system impedance goes up. The arc resistance of the arc doesn't really matter much anymore, and so we kind of, you know, we kind of go up and hit, you know, close to 100%. But over, you know, over a pretty wide range, we're pretty close to that maximum power. The three models have converged, and we see that even more powerfully when you look over there at the power graph. Uh, over that, you know, 10 kA all the way up to 100 kA, looks like both of them are up there 90% or more of maximum power to the arc, maybe even 95% or more. So we've got, again, pretty good convergence between the three models in this situation. Unfortunately, that doesn't happen everywhere. Next example we got, we kept the gap the same, 25 millimeter gap, but moved it up to 500 volts. Well, now we've got the same gap, so roughly the same resistance across the arc, but we increased the voltage, so we got more current, we would expect. And sure enough, that's what we see. Um, remember before we had our lines there kind of around the blue line, now they're just shifting up. The maximum power still stays there right at 50%, but the other two models, 70 to 80% arcing fault current. So it's a much higher percentage of the total bolted fault current available. That means we're coming down off that maximum power graph on the right. Maximum power or power delivered to the arc, 60, 70, 80%, kind of more typical ranges than the 90, 95 that we were looking at before. What does that mean? Again. Which one is most accurate? I'm not entirely sure. But what do we know? We know that the three models are not converging anymore. You run calculations with this one, you run calculations with that one, you're gonna get a different answer. 
well, uh, and, and I promise I'm not going to just say I don't know on, on every slide. We'll get to some conclusions in a minute. But yeah, I mean, you, you kind of understand some of the difficulties in looking at this stuff, right? It's, you know, we, we're, we're comparing, but where is the benchmark that we can really look at? We need some test data in order to do that. <clears throat> we looked at other things, and I'm going to go, I'm going to go through these fairly quickly uh, rather than dwell on the, on the grass, but I looked at um, arcing fault current versus bolted fault current at 500 volt DC for various gap widths. And these are the, you know, these are the Stokes Oppenlander and the power cut models. The way I've got this graph done, the, the, the values for the same gap are in the same color. So six millimeters up top, the two red ones, Stokes is in, is the, the clean graph. The power cut has the, you know, the, the, the marks on it, uh, all the way down to the bottom 200 millimeters. You can see, obviously, we, we, we go through that range. With the small gap, we have arcing fault current that's pretty close to the, you know, the bolted fault current level. What does that mean? Less power delivered to the arc itself. The other extreme, the big gap, you know, more resistance entered into the circuit. We're down there 20, 10, 15, 20, 25% bolted fault current. Again, we're going to be way down the graph when it comes to looking at power. Um, I was trying to find out if we had some kind of equivalence between our two alternate models here. You know, I noticed that like the Powkert six millimeter was close to the Stokes 25 millimeters. So I thought, okay, well maybe there's just a factor of four if we took this one and multiplied it by four, maybe it works. But it didn't. It didn't seem to hold through with the other, you know, with the other values that were that were out there. <coughs> here is similar one, I guess, arcing fault current versus bolted fault current for a 25 millimeter gap with different voltage levels, and we see a result that's probably fairly similar. Um, you know, the low voltage is down at the bottom, high voltage up at top. Um, a couple of things to note, I guess one, uh, the, the green lines are 250 volt uh, DC systems with a 25 millimeter gap. Again, those are kind of sandwiched around the 50% line. For whatever gap value you pick, there's a voltage level where if you look at that combination of gap and voltage, the three models converge. I don't care if you got 600 volts, I don't care if you got 250, I don't care if you got 1,000, you can make the three models converge and basically give you close to the same answer. We'll see that when we look at some of the test results later. The other thing that was interesting, and we'll look at this more uh, fully in, a, in another graph, the blue one, that's 500 volt systems. Okay, we know 500 volt systems, but 500 volt DC, I, th I thought, well, that's probably roughly equal to a 40 volt RMS AC system. We can do 40 volt RMS AC calculations with a 25 millimeter bus gap. That's kind of the standard set up or one of the default options in IEEE 1584. How do those results compare? I'll show you in just a couple of graphs. Power, same thing here, kind of another way to look at what we already talked about, but again, the 250 volt, 25 millimeter, there's, there's where we're converging. If we were looking at a different gap, we'd have a different set of lines that were up there near the, you know, near the top of the graph. Made me wonder if I could find, well, uh, yeah, this I, this slide. Yeah, we'll kind of we'll go through it quickly, but I'll, I'll explain it anyway. Stokes and Oppenlander and Powker. One of the things you notice when you go through all these graphs. Let me back up one. The Stokes, the clear. You know, the the well. Yeah, I'll get to the current. Stokes model always predicts higher arcing current than the Powker model. If you're looking at those two, you know, those two calculation models just compared against one another. Doesn't matter what set of parameters you're looking at. Always gives you more arcing current. So I, w I was wondering, you know, the shapes otherwise look pretty similar. I was wondering if we could find essentially an equivalent gap to kind of bring those two models together. Maybe they're just off by a little factor or something. Maybe we can make a match. And so that's what I was trying to do on this one. I set the Powkert gap equal to 100 millimeters and then solved for an equivalent gap in the Stokes model to see if I could match them up, minimize the error between the two graphs. Obviously, the shapes aren't exactly the same. But that's the result I got. Uh, Powkert 100 millimeter most closely corresponded to a Stokes 156. I don't know if I was trying to develop some kind of grand unified theory of electrode gaps. I don't know if I exactly did that, but you know, at least that, it, was, it was interesting to me. I didn't take the time to go and look and see how it worked out on, 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 on other locations. I think what, what it shows, we have models that are similar, but by no means are they identical. I told you we're going to look at the IEEE 1584 again, come back to the AC versus DC. Here's a situation, 40 volt AC, so 40 volt RMS versus 500 volt DC. Of course, that's 500 volt RMS. There's some equivalence there. Yeah, I recognize the AC voltage is going to have a higher peak, but we had to have some way to compare it. You know, it seemed reasonable enough. 
would we get similar values for arcing fault current between those two models, the IEEE 1584 versus our, our, our other DC models? Stokes and Oppenheimer and Paukert, that's the green and purple graphs up there to the top. Clearly, they're a little bit higher than what we get out of IEEE 1584. IEEE 1584 clo more closely matches our maximum power method. Same thing, we saw the scale's a little bit different, but on the right, I looked at 208 volt AC RMS versus 250 volt DC. Again, a pretty good difference between Stokes and Oppenheimer and Paukert versus IEEE 1584. I guess what it goes to show us here, AC and DC arcs are different animals. I thought, well, you know, let's look at it, very similar parameters, but clearly we're getting some differences in the results. How significant is that? Another reason we need some testing. We need to you know, further validate this, look at, look at it, see what it, you know, see what it really means for us in incident energy evaluation. So what have we learned in all this? Stokes and Oppenlander, consistently higher arcing fault current than the Paukert model, but the model that yielded maximum power was variable, depending on the particular combination we had for voltage, for gap. Uh, for each voltage level, there is a value of gap width where the, the, the models converge. Sometimes you will hear people say, you know, they've done the calculation with the uh, NFPA 70E maximum power method. They say, oh, this is, gives me a number that's just way too high. This is a terrible method. Not necessarily. There are a lot of cases when actually the three models are pretty close. The worst deviations were at the extremes. In some cases, the parameters probably didn't make a whole lot of sense. I didn't show you nearly anywhere near all the, you know, all the calculations that we did, but you know, I, I ran things even as extreme as like a thousand volt DC with a six millimeter gap. The results didn't look very good there. We were way away from that maximum power point. 250 volt or even 125 volt in a 200 millimeter gap. You know, could we even really sustain an arc across that kind of gap be, uh, between the electrodes? Maybe not. And the, you know, those other calculation models may give us an indication that that, that that could be the case. What if we plug that stuff into maximum power? 50% arcing fault current, voltage across the gap, one half the system voltage. It's just making that base assumption. The other ones give us some insight that maximum power may not, because it is a reasonable conclusion that maximum power is gonna break down at the extremes as well. The other methods give us some more insight into that. What did we confirm? We confirmed a couple of things that were consistent with the AC world, IEEE 1584. One of those, at low fault currents, the arcing fault current is actually much closer to the bolted fault current because system impedance starts to dominate. Again, maximum power method, doesn't matter what set of parameters you plug in, arcing fault current equals half the bolted fault current. It's conservative. Um, sometimes that doesn't make sense. Again, it may not be as far off as it is sometimes believed in many situations. Um, again, extremely difficult to draw many solid conclusions. I, I do have some conclusions that I'm going to show you in the, in, in the conclusions part of it. But first, we need to get through our case study and our test results. Um, now, I didn't even talk about energy yet. You know, we're talking about arcing fault current. We're talking about power delivered to the arc. What we're really interested in, incident energy levels. That's what the worker has to select his PPE based upon. That's what the, you know, really, that's really where the rubber meets the road. That adds a whole other layer of complexity to all this because now you add clearing time as a variable. And of course, that is not something that's easy to put into an equation. You have a breaker, you know, it's clearly not a linear, the clearing time is clearly not a linear function of anything. Um, fuse, maybe it's a little bit more well behaved. You don't have the big discontinuity, you know, when you get below the instantaneous trip point or whatever, but still makes it difficult when you start plugging energy into this. Um, but we will look at that as well as part of the case, you know, the case study that we're going to look at and then the, then the test results. So our case study, we've got some calculation results from a real project. We took these three methods and, and see what we can learn, learn from them on that. We had a, a comprehensive ETAP model that had been developed for a mid-size solar plant, solar PV, uh, where we had PV panels. Uh, organized into arrays. We had recombiners, uh, DC collection systems, inverters, and then all the stuff on the AC side to tie it back into the grid. Uh, what we did was look at the arc flash event at the inverter, or one of the inverter DC buses. That was only one point, you know, one location out of this whole model. Uh, but my intent is to you know, get through this in a reasonable amount of time rather than prolong it. So we're gonna, that's going to be kind of our case study, the inverter DC bus. The system DC operating voltage 600 volts, we're using calculation method number one. More on this in a minute. Um, 
in the solar system, it, as is often the case, there's not enough fault current for the DC fuses to actually clear the fault within the customary two second clearing time. So we use two seconds as the fault clearing time. We, we performed instant energy calculations with maximum power, with Palkert and with Stokes. Um, considered the equipment as a panel board box, the 12 by 14 by nine inch enclosure, which comes out to be more important than you would think. I'll get to that in a minute. Working distance, 18 inches, and well, I'll show you what we looked at. The first one here is results with each method for our solar inverter uh, for the given PV system and a 25 millimeter gap. So for each of them, of course, the bolted fault current's the same, 1700 amps or so. Arcing fault current for the max power, half that value. Voltage across the arc for maximum power, half that value. Incident energy, 15 calories, roughly 14.93. Pauken and Stokes, the results were almost identical for those, but they were quite different than maximum power. Arcing fault current about 1,500 amps. I think that worked out to about 85%, maybe 86, 87% of our bolted fault current. So we're a pretty good distance away from that 50% assumption. Arcing voltage, 80 volts instead of 300. We're down at, I think, 15% or less of the total 600 volt system voltage. Incident energy. 3.36 calories versus 14.9, so we're only about 25%. Now, if you went back to that graph I showed you earlier when we had that kind of sinusoidal thing on the, you know, the power transferred to the arc, and if you looked at a, a current of 85%, what you would find is that we would expect to see about 45% of the maximum power actually delivered to the arc in that situation. And here I'm showing you a little bit less than 25% incident energy. Why is that? I'll tell you in a minute. Again, difference between the power and the energy calculation. But again, that's a pretty, you know, pretty significant difference between the three. So we took that result and kind of extended it a little bit and looked at voltage and, and current through the arc versus different values of gap. What if we had a different electrode gap? How would that change things? On the left, there's the arc voltage. On the right, it's current. We'll, we'll just look at the current because basically the graphs are showing you the same thing. Just one goes up, one goes down. Uh, on the right, arc and current, when we have a very small electro gap, we don't have much resistance in the arc itself. And so that arcing fault current is very high, or you know, high at least compared to the, to the bolted fault current. As we go up in gap, the arcing fault current goes down. Um, with the Stokes, the green one, it's a smooth line because remember that's a continuous function. With the power current, we have different uh, equations that apply for different levels of gap, and so it kind of jumps around a little bit, and you know, don't get worried about that. And then it flatlines at 200 millimeters for power current. The maximum gap that he considered was 200 millimeters, and so we kind of reach a, you know, reach a, a, a value at that point. Notice what happens when we get to that 200 millimeter point. All the values from the three models are pretty much the same. There is a point where we have converged. Three models are giving us the same value. So, if we plugged 200 millimeters into our calculation instead of 25, would we get incident energy levels that matched from the three calculation models? Turns out you don't. We plug it in, here's incident energy versus the gap values, 200 millimeters. Uh, hard to read based on the scale of the graph, but it's about 7.5 calories, which is about 50% of the, uh, the energy that we get with a maximum power method. Turns out this difference is caused by the way the two models calculate the effects of the enclosure. If you've, looked at, if you've ever looked at the details of the maximum power method in IEEE, or not IEEE, 158410, NFPA 70E, it says if you have an arc in an enclosure, you take the open air results and multiply it by three. Different methodology for the other two. Basically, I went back, and, and I don't show the numbers here, but I ran the calculations with open air arcs for all three models, and the three were only off by a, about a quarter of a calorie per centimeter squared between the three of them. Very good convergence. It only goes apart when we consider the effects of the enclosure because the Stokes and Oppenlander and power cut models, the way that they're implemented, just less of a multiplier to consider the effects of the enclosure. So our energy in our original calculation was about 25% of that maximum power method. About 25% of the difference was accounted for by the fact that we were, you know, we were getting away from that point where we had 50% uh, arcing fault current. The other 50% all comes back to how the enclosure was modeled. Thought that was, you know, that was something I didn't expect when I started looking into this stuff. Um, 
And now method two, again, it's going to hit the, the highlights of this, but there's basically there's some issues that you, you can run into when you start doing calculations in solar PV systems because the solar panels don't tend to act like a normal voltage source, which we like to use, you know, we like to consider when we're doing calculations. They act more like a current source in that the, the fault current output stays pretty much the same uh, over a, a wide range of voltage output on the panels. And so the maximum power is not exactly at the same maximum power point anymore. ETAP now has a, what they call a method two that, that lets us do a different calculation with that. Again, the tutorial session Wednesday afternoon, I'm gonna be there listening to it. If you're interested in this, good thing to, good thing to be a part of. Okay, let's compare it with test data. So we looked at, you know, we kind of looked, we compared the methods to themselves, we compared them uh, in our case study. Now let's look and see what actual test data we have that we can compare these against. And I want to give a big shout out here to Albert in, in Mandar with ETAP. Uh, they went and found um, some test data and helped, helped kind of extract the information that we, that we could that I'm going to show you. Um, it, it, I thought we had a pretty good presentation put together, but thanks to these guys, we kind of, kind of really kind of brought it home, tied it all together by actually finding some very, it's still very limited, but at least it's better than zero uh, arcing test data that we could look at. What have we got? This, this test data was actually from a, a, a presentation put together by Kinetrix, the, the test lab, who had done some testing on DC arcs at some point. First results for a 600 volt DC system, six inch bus gap on the left, there's our arcing versus bolted fault current. 600 volts, six inch gap, it just so turns out that that's one of the set of parameters where the three models basically converge. Stokes, Oppenlander, Powkert, Max Power, they're all kind of sitting very close to each other. Powkert's a little bit lower, but I mean, we know him. He likes to, be, likes to be lower for that arcing fault current. The red values, the red dots connected by the red lines, that's the test value points. So that's right in line with what the, you know, the calculation models are showing us. And then over on the right-hand side, incident energy versus arcing current, Max Power, Stokes, Powkert all line up pretty closely, and they're both above. All three of them are above the actual tested values here for the open air 600 volt six inch um, uh, configuration that's actually a good thing i mean we in, in an ideal world we'd like those those models to be a little bit closer to the actual values but if you're going to miss you want to miss a little bit high and so it's not the worst thing in the world that we you know we're a little bit over what we'd see from the actual test values with these models um, so you know interesting that's good let's look at a different configuration 600 volt dc 25 millimeter gap, so we go from six inches down to one inch. What would you expect when we reduce the gap size? We're gonna have more current, and certainly we see that. The maximum power, he's consistent. He's always staying right where it's gonna be. Arcing fault current equals one half the bolted fault current, but the other two models have moved up the graph quite a bit. The test results actually kind of split the difference between the two. So we're, you know, it, we're, not entire, we're not sitting right on top of those test value arcing fault current levels, um, but at least we're, you know, there, our alternate models are showing us that we did move away uh, from that, that maximum power assumption. The bigger change is when we look at the incident energy level over there on the right. Max power in purple, very much overestimating the amount of energy delivered to the worker in that situation. Stokes and Oppenlander and Powkert pretty close to one another and very slightly above our test values. Now, if you were designing a model, that's one of the things you'd want to see. That's not bad. Let's look at one more. Got one more test result we can look at here was arc in a box testing. So we got the enclosure thrown in. One more wrinkle in it, we've got a horizontal electrode configuration. Uh, 600 volts, um, one inch gap, so 25 millimeters again, 12 inch working distance. Maximum power, now he's way out in left field now very high incident energy level that we're, that we're looking at. The other models, we got Stokes and Oppenlander, we got Powkert. We have a Kinetrix equation. They actually developed their own equation. They didn't tell us exactly what it was, but at least we could look at the graph and kind of reproduce it here. All three of those cluster together, and all three of those cluster fairly close to the test values. Now, we don't have that little layer of conservatism built in that we probably like to see where the, you know, the calculation model is a little bit above the tested values. Still. Not too bad. This is far from conclusive. We don't have full information on the test that Kinetrix did. There was a lot of, you know, Mandar did some wizardry trying to extract the information that we could figure out. I mean, he was scaling stuff off of PDFs and whatever, trying to figure out enclosure size and all this. Um, but at least it's something. 
and it validates at least a little bit that these alternate calculation methods may not be totally out in left field if they give us a result that's different from NFPA 70E. So I just wanted to share that with you and show you what we could find out as far as testing goes. Let's wrap it up here before John starts yelling at me. Um, what are the takeaways? Now, I'd like to be able to tell you exactly what method you should use and when you should use it. The truth is there are problems with all of them. Maximum power based on assumptions. Is it conservative? Yes. Is sometimes it is overly conservative? Maybe so. Stokes and Oppenheimer and Powkert, they're empirical models, but both of them are based at least in part on 50 hertz AC testing. I showed you that one slide where we looked at IEEE 1584, 1584 versus the Stokes and Powkert and how DC and AC may not be exactly equivalent. Is that important? We don't know. Be, you know, so always kind of, kind of, kind of be aware, kind of keep that caution in the back of your mind if you're, if you're using these alternate methods, because we really need more DC test data to benchmark any of these calculations against. We've given you some more background on the three models. Have shown some comparisons regarding their performance. We've shown that the three models do converge for certain sets of parameters, and we've shown you that the little, what little test data we do have is encouraging, at least relative to the accuracy of Stokes and Oppenheimer and Powkert but ultimately still inconclusive. Suggestions. For low fault currents or large gaps, I think uh, Powkert and Stokes and Oppenlander are probably better models to use than our maximum power. What, the trick is defining what is low. One thing to look at, one thing, I, you know, kind of my initial thought, maybe if we got a situation where the arcing fault current was more than 75% of the bolted fault current, we could say that happens when arcing fault currents are low. Maybe that's a trigger for moving over to you know, one of these alternate calculation models. Maximum power method is not to be believed for, uh, not really believed to be realistic for extreme situations. How, what is extreme? Well, you know, we, we saw some of these things, 250 volt DC, 200 millimeter gap. The Stokes model said, you know, the arcing fault current was less than 10% of the bolted fault current. Is that really realistic? Or is that kind of telling us that, hey, we can't really sustain an arc in that situation? I think that may, you know, may be closer to the latter than, uh, than the former. The most extreme example, we actually got a call from one of our, our test labs at one of our manufacturing plants. They wanted us to calculate uh, the arc flash levels on a 95 kV test bay where we did BIL testing of switchgear. They had capacitors they could charge up and get you know, extreme voltages out of those. Even though taking, you take into account that the capacitors don't hold much energy, you plug that into the maximum power equation and no pun intended, the results blow up. So, you know, that's that as extreme as it gets, but, you know, we can't, it, just because maximum power says, okay, we can, it doesn't really have the, the limitations on it. Well, it does. NFPA 70E says don't use it above 1,000 uh, volts. That's one of the reasons why. At mainstream systems, 250 volts to 600 volt DC, 25 to 50 millimeter gap, moderate levels of fault current, you know, a few KA up to whatever, uh, the three methods are probably going to have an arc power within about 20 to 25 percent of one another. If you see differences in them, the differences are going to be due to differences in fault clearing time and differences in the way the enclosure is accounted for, not differences in the underlying model themselves. When the right answer is not obvious, consider doing some form of sensitivity analysis where you may look at more than one method, see what, you know, see what kind of results that you get. Here's a big one. If you are going to use the Stokes and Oppenlander or Powkert methods, you need to be concerned about the size of the enclosure. Not something historically we've worried about, John, this is my last slide. DC maximum power method, it just says if we got arc in a box, you multiply the result by three. IEEE 1584, whether you've got a low voltage panel board or low voltage switch gear, different enclosure sizes, but this, the, the multiplier is the same. If it's in a box, the result is about twice what it would be if it was open air. But with these methods, Stokes, Oppenlander, and Powkert, you get a 1.5 multiplier for low voltage panel boards. That's the 12 by 14 by 8 enclosure. 2.74 times for low voltage switch gear, the 20 by 20 by 20 inch enclosure. That is a selection you have to make in ETAP and it doesn't populate it for you. So be intentional about what you put in there and make sure you use something that is realistic for your actual model that you're trying to do. And last but not least for the solar PV, don't forget our method number two. And with that, I'm done.